Yeah, so this will be a series of five lectures that uh, by the end will allow you to compute Brauer-Mannin obstructions and thereby obtain examples of Diophantine equations that violate the Hasse principle. Uh, so l let me start with motivation. Um, the Hasse principle Okay, so I think you heard about this in the first talk this morning. Um, this is a principle that is satisfied in some cases. So if you have a Diophantine equation, let me just do an example. This is motivation, so this is not important. So for many examples of Diophantine equations, so we seek a solution in integers and non-trivial. So a very easy first thing to do when you look at an equation like that is to try reducing it modulo various numbers and try to see if you can um, get some kind of contradiction. So of course you have an integer solution. You may as well assume it's minimal in some sense, at least having no common prime factors to x, y, and z. So you try reducing modulo various numbers like 3, 7, 11, and for instance, mod, mod 7, you see that you have then an equation which forces x and z to be 0 mod 7 if you just try different possibilities. But then, plugging back in, you see that the first and last terms are divisible by 7 squared, and that forces then y to be divisible by 7 as well. And so this violates the assumption of having no prime factors. And by this very easy test, you see that there can be no non-trivial integer solutions. Now let's just change one of the numbers and see what happens. So if you try to play the same game now, you see that in fact there are solutions, mod 3, mod 7, mod 17, and so easily it follows, or with only a, a little bit of additional work, it follows that this has solutions modulo every integer. And in fact, so the, um, so the Hasse principle, so for, first of all, what was observed by by uh, Legendre for equations of this form and then later for, uh, let's get it, Minkowski. If you have any homogeneous polynomial 
of degree 2 And if you can verify this sort of condition, then it will follow that there are, in fact, integer solutions. Then Q. So this is, in fact, the, the correct way of um, expressing the fact that it has non-trivial solutions modulo every integer, that you have piadic solutions, and also you um, also verify that there are real solutions. So ob obviously, as we saw there in the top example, if you fail modulo some prime or power of a prime, then there, you rule out the existence of integer solutions. But the implication in the other direction is a non-trivial statement. And it's a very important result. And it depends on uh, very much on the shape of the equations that are given. So this theorem applies to homogeneous polynomials of degree 2 and in fact fails for more general polynomials, and we'll see some examples of that. So this just illustrates this principle, and um, I should point out that there can also be examples, so other, ex um, so more generally, Um, we can work with any number field. So, uh, well, uh, I shouldn't. There is an analogous statement with Q replaced by, a n by any number field. So, of course, I could have just as well said we seek rational solutions because you can multiply by common denominators and get an integer solution from a rational solution. So, in, for homogeneous uh, polynomials, integer versus rational makes no difference. So, but now you can replace the field of rational numbers by any finite extension. And there's an analogous statement where you have now, instead of the reals and the piatics, these become all completions of a number field. So in the case of Q, you have these completions. And in general, you have some collection of both um, Archimedean and non-Archimedean completions. So I'll say the Hasse principle
holds also for cyclic norm equations. So you have a number field K, you have a cyclic extension L, and you have some element here. And so you're trying to solve this equation for you in L. And we'll see And so we'll be studying counterexamples to the Hasse principle. Now, so let's that statement there was from roughly the 1920s. Even though the, the case of polynomials in three variables had been treated by Legendre in the late 18th century. So, but this more general statement came later. And then it's hard to say when exactly mathematicians first realized that such a phenomenon wouldn't hold in general, but at least what, what I see in the li literature, the, what's considered the oldest example of counterexample to the Hasse principle is from around 1940. So, uh, do independently to two people, Lind and Reichert. And it's a weighted homogeneous equation. So again, we see non-trivial solutions, and this has no Okay, so if you look here, you see that this is actually saying several things. It's saying that it has uh, real solutions, that's obvious, and p-adic solutions for every p, that's not, not obvious, but can be shown very... It's weighted homogeneous. So the point is, if you scale v and w by some scale, and scale u, let's say by lambda, and you scale u by lambda squared, you get a new solution. So it behaves a, much like there, where, so there's the obvious trivial solution, 0, 0, 0, and we just look for some other solution. And if there should exist a rational solution, and then by scaling you can make it an integer solution. Okay, so what, if I'm, I'm, I, wa I do want to show you this example. So I will take a few moments to convince you that it has p-adic solutions for every p. And then uh, we'll show you that it has no integer solutions. Okay, so um, now I will make most of you bored by reviewing facts about the p-adics 
which I assume are familiar to everybody. So, um, so there's the piatic integers. with um, quotient field for piatic numbers. And then there's something called Hensel's lemma, which, OK, you can think of it in several. You can think of it geometrically. That's to say, you have an algebraic variety over the piatic integers. And you reduce mod p and take a smooth point and it lifts to a piatic point. Or just in terms of equations, if you have some polynomial and let's say you have a solution f of x naught to 0 mod p and So it's some statement like this, that if you have a, a smooth point, then it lifts. So for instance, um, which square roots, uh, so uh, let's say A, Of, uh, should avoid, um, yeah. Yeah. it should be a little bit smaller. So I take a non zero mod p, and so let's see, what is it? So for odd p, it's just saying a is a quadratic residue of mod p. So that's a direct application of that statement because you solve uh, mod p and then lift using, since the derivative here is 2x. So, but for p is 2, well, so, so I should say that, so, ZP solutions can also be obtained when and so um, now yeah you don't have this statement but you can essentially use the same method so let, let me just work out this case Take okay, so I've just written down the equation for x squared equals some number uh, that's one mod eight and p equals two. So then we take um, yeah, so then. You just write down something like f of uh, uh, plus something, I don't know, I mean, I'm 2 to the k y or some, some such thing like that might, might give something good, I don't know. Um, let's just subtract. So I don't know, you have to sort of expand this. And so you get um, 2 to the k plus 1. Um, I mean, no, I can't. Yeah. 
So what is it saying? That as long as k is at least 2, then you can make such an adjustment, and then you can change the difference as a multiple of 2 to the k plus 1. And so inductively, you can um, lift to uh, increasing precision, st starting with a square root, um, well, just 1 as your x naught, and then you continue. OK, and uh, well, now, yeah, ev everyone certainly knows quadratic reciprocity, so there's no, well, but I think just to have it on, on the blackboard, it's, well, as a handy reference, let me just waste some moments and put it on here. So Gauss, of course, worked in Göttingen. So. OK, so now let's see, what, what do I owe you? I owe you some piadic solutions. And Okay, so let's see, piadic solutions. Um, um, take u, u equal to zero. So uh, 17 has a square root in Q2. And then that square root is, well, if you choose, choose the appropriate square root, it, it'll be 1 mod 8. And so you take the square root again. So there is a fourth root. OK, now let's see. P odd. Well. So there are two possible approaches. There's the, the, the oh, you can take p equal to 17, and then, well, I don't even know what it is. Um, ah, 1 over square root of 2. So you can get existence of piadic solutions directly from Hensel's lemma using the fact that when p is different from 2 and 17, that equation has what's called good reduction mod p. So it defines a smooth curve of the same shape modulo p. I mean, it's a, because it's, um, it's, it's weighted homogeneous. So it's a curve in weighted projective space. Anyway, it's an elliptic curve. I mean, it has, it's a curve of genus 1. And so we, we know that such a curve must have uh, points. And so, yeah, there's some uh, general theory. So there is this QP solutions by Hensel's. So using since. And this is, in fact, always the case. So that means that there are only finitely many primes where you need to work. And for all the rest of the primes, you can just invoke some, some machinery.
to get the existence of solutions. So the testing of the Hasse principle, at least the testing of the local conditions, the p-adic solutions, is a finite process. But it uses theory. I mean, you now, if you're not familiar with this, then I'll also give a direct argument for just by, um, by some ad hoc, I mean, I just wrote down some solutions. So when p is plus or minus 1 mod 8, then there's again, well, just like, like this. Yeah, because that's what this says. To yeah. And uh, what else? When p is three mod eight. Then we can do something like. And when p, so we, yeah, of course, this. Being a quadratic residue or not is multiplicative. This is to be a quadratic residue modulo p, let's say. So for minus 2, well, you use both of these conditions, and you see that 3 mod 8 um, minus 2 is a quadratic residue. So what's that? P is 5. Then there are three possibilities. So one of. So one, one, one of these is a QP solution. Okay, so now for, um, but no, yeah, so now I just to show you that there are no, no Q solutions. So suppose no common. So then, um, so if you just see what it tells you, uh, mod 17, uh, you see that u can only be one of the following choices, plus minus 3, plus minus 5, plus minus 6, or plus minus 7. So. In fact, exactly the Non the non-quadratic residues. Okay. Now for general p. Let's say odd p. Uh, so. Uh, what are, yeah, okay. If u is divisible by some odd prime, well, okay, uh, zero is, is, is not allowed. So, in fact, this p would have to be different from 17. So, we have an odd prime, not 17, dividing u. Then, based on that equation, now the left hand side vanishes mod p. So, this u and v, uh, v and w. Um, well, they show that 17 
is a square mod p. So if there were a common, let, let's suppose that 3 were to divide u, v, and w, then I would divide v and w Yeah, if then the right hand side would be divisible by 3 to the fourth. So that would in fact force u to be divisible twice. So now I divide u by 3 squared, divide v and w each by 3, and I get a smaller solution. OK, so by quadratic reciprocity, yeah, P is a quadratic residue mod 17. Now, U is a product of a number of these primes, as well as plus or minus 1, perhaps 2. Well. Minus 1 and 2 are quadratic residues mod 17, so they don't contribute. And every prime divisor of u is a quadratic residue mod 17. So u itself must be quadratic residue mod 17, which is just a contradiction to what we deduced previously. Yes, in this case. And if you have a more, a more general equation, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's right. It's, in this case, it's a curve. And so you have a curve. And you know its genus is 1. And so the has of A bounds. In fact, every genus 1 curve has a point. Now, if you had a, let's say, a higher degree equation, you'd have a higher genus curve. And then possibly for some small primes, you would have to check those still because the Hasse A bounds would be too weak. You wouldn't, but for sufficiently large prime, then you would know by the Hasse A bounds that there are points. So it, it always reduces you to doing a finite amount of checking. Okay, so I think yeah, we're we're happy with this example. We see it uses quadratic reciprocity. Now I just want to just restate things a little bit. There's something called the Hilbert symbol. Defined as follows. So this, this is a, well, is a prime or infinity, which means so it's what's called a place. It's a, a completion. It, it, it denotes a completion of Q. So either a finite place or infinity.
So of course, again here, we have the remark that, let's say if it's a prime. If the prime does not divide, or is, well, as I've stated it, A and B are rational numbers. But if that prime does not show up in the numerator or denominator of A or B, then it's again a case where you have good reduction mod P. And so you know there exist solutions. So, um, or more, more, more directly by Chevalier's theorem. If A and B are integers, then A x squared plus B y squared plus. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So for two, I don't care. Because two is a quadratic residue mod 17. So, so yeah, I'm perfectly happy to have two dividing u uh, as many times as you want, because it, it doesn't change that calculation to have a factor of 2. That what? No, here it uses uh, all primes, all prime divisors of u. And then, yeah, using quadratic reciprocity, you switch it to mod 17. But it's, it's combining information from all the primes. It's, it's not purely a local calculation. OK, so the, the point of this, the reason why I'm doing this, is just to give you a new language for talking about this sort of argument. So the Hilbert. Reciprocity law states that the product overall, overall, so oh, this means primes as well as infinity, all places of, of the value of this Hilbert symbol, I mean, by this remark, there can only be finitely many primes for which it takes the value minus 1. Now, if I can state. Um, Again, th this is very much a review for most of you. You've, you've all seen this. But I can state as an exercise for anyone who hasn't seen it to show that the statement of the Hilbert reciprocity law is equivalent to or can be deduced from quadratic reciprocity. And to restate that argument,
in this example, using using the the Hilbert symbol 17u and so do one more so let's consider the following equation Again, it's weighted homogeneous. And so, yeah, this is due to Viskovsky, 1971. And use, so let's see, what do we have? Well, we have notice that the right hand side, well, like if you bring V over to this side, then you see U squared equals minus 1 times V squared plus this times 1. So. This one is Kofsky. Maybe it's not Kofsky. Oh, is this for Iskovsky? KH? I don't know. Is that the... Is that better? Okay, maybe it's right. I don't know. Um. Okay, so the, of course now, see the Hilbert symbol is multiplicative in each variable. Like let's say, if you do A here and you put BC here, then it's just AB times AC. So it has a nice multiplicative property. And then here, so if this is 1, then these two are equal. OK, so this. Um, well, in, oh, uh, yeah, by the end of today, I hope we'll see that these can be viewed as Brouwer group elements. So, see, so yeah, I'm, yeah, okay, so up until now, this is just motivation. Perhaps I should have gone a little faster. Um, but, so, the topic for today is what's supposed to be Brouwer groups and Galois cohomology. And, well, I should at least be able to talk about Brouwer groups. Now, again, that's something classical. So um, I think most people here have seen Brouwer groups. So again, at the risk of uh, causing a lot of boredom, I will recall Brouwer groups. be a field and we consider finite dimensional central simple algebras in general non commutative okay so 
this is a, I mean, I think that everyone knows what this means, but it's simple means having no non-trivial two-sided ideals. And central means that the center is K. And so there's a structure theorem due to Wedderburn. That such an algebra is isomorphic to a matrix algebra over a division algebra. So, if we have two finite dimensional central simple algebras over K, then so is their uh, tensor product. So it's also central simple algebra, and so is the, the opposite. The, so you take the algebra with the opposite multiplicative structure, and these define the multiplication and inverse in the Brouwer group. Burkay, who's Elements are classes of finite dimensional simple algebras. Up to what's called Brouwer equivalence. And Brouwer equivalence says that two algebras are Brouwer equivalent if they're equal up to taking matrix algebras. So now, of course, by look at the structure theorem. So A is a matrix algebra over division algebra, and so is B. So this is really equivalent to saying that the, the division algebras, in each case, are isomorphic. In other words, A is a matrix algebra over D, and B is also a matrix algebra over the same D. And so then each of these is just a bigger matrix. Yeah, so we just have matrix algebras over D. So in some sense, the, you can, if you want to work with elements concretely, you can just work with division algebras. But every time you do a group operation, then you have to sort of reduce by writing it as a matrix algebra over division algebra. Yes. So I didn't, OK, well, I, yeah, I put central there for some. Yeah, I mean, of course, it, it would follow. Because if you look at M, M, N of D, the, the center is the center of D. So if you have such an isomorphism, then D has to have center equal to K. And again, the same remark, what I was saying here. So concretely, in terms of elements, 
the representative elements are central division algebras over K. So let me just write down an example. So first of all, a fact. Then after so after taking a finite field extension, th then you, you get a matrix algebra. So in particular, any central simple algebra has dimension that's a square. OK, so let's look at some examples. Well, by this fact, if k is algebraically closed, Power group is trivial. Now, theorem of Frobenius characterizes all non-commutative, uh, well, es essentially the unique algebra, the unique division algebra over R that's central is the class of the Hamilton quaternions. And so the Brower group has order two. No, sorry. Oh, sorry, this is a complete mess. If A is a, I mean, this is this abbreviation, finite dimensional central simple algebra, then there's a finite field extension, K prime of K. The line after that. In particular, the dimension of it of, is a square. This is dimension. OK, so um, well, uh, I, I really should have uh, covered more. OK, so lo local class field theory identifies the Brouwer group of the p addicts with q ma z. And then by global class field theory, there's a, a short exact sequence. And this is then more general also or arbitrary number fields. So here, here, here again, I'm using this notation where you sum over all places. So again, this is all primes as well as the place at infinity. And for a general number field, you have all, all valuations, both Archimedean and non-Archimedean. OK, and just as a last example, we have quaternion algebras. So if you have A and B, uh, let's say, assume that the characteristic is not 2, and then A and B are non-zero field elements, then you, you take an algebra. Uh, what a notation, I don't know. Let's just write it like, like this, A, B. So this is an algebra with, you have I and J, and I squared is A, J squared is B, and I and J anti-commute. Yeah? In the exact sequence, the, what is the projection map? 
This one, this map here is the, well, it uses, so th this is canonical. So you, each of these maps by the canonical isomorphism here to Q mod Z, and then for any, well, for the real place, you have a two element group and that maps to the two element subgroup here. And so you just have the sum of local, in, it's the sum of all the invariants here. Okay, so um, I guess what I can say about this, so eg, when k is r, then minus 1, minus 1, is Hamilton quaternions, and, well, then there's this uh, um, help. Uh, so the Hilbert symbol is 1, if, well, A and B is zero. So this Hilbert symbol is exactly producing elements of the Brouwer group. So if you have A and B rational numbers, then you think of this as an element of the Brouwer group of Q, and the Hilbert symbol is telling you whether when you pass to a completion, this element becomes the trivial element, or whether this element stays non-trivial. And so this sort of argument here We'll say that you get counterexamples to the Hasse principle, or if you have some kind of a way of understanding in a finer way the Hasse principle by writing down elements of the Brouwer group. Now, notice that here you involve some elements of the function field. So you think of it geometrically as a surface, and you have elements of the function field. So it's a Brouwer group element on the surface. And then this kind of argument, well, what, what we saw using quadratic reciprocity when it's phrased in this language becomes an argument using Brouwer group elements. Unfortunately, I didn't have time today for group cohomology, Galois cohomology, so I will start with that next time. <laughs>